I've ever had of my um, psychedelic experiences and it was in 1985 yeah. and I had been involved suing the DEA trying to protect the medical use of MDMA and Leo Zeff who was the leader of the underground psychedelic therapy movement who was the secret chief he thought that it would be helpful for me to have a psychedelic therapy experience so that I would be more effective as a political advocate and that a lot of it is uh, dealing with your own shadows and not projecting out that uh, you know the people that you're fighting are your 100% your enemies. That there's some parts of them that are uh, maybe you could reach them. So um, Leo offered me a therapy session to try to tune me up as a political activist to save MDMA. And so we went off to um, a friend's house um, right on the San Francisco Bay, and the way that he did it, he gave 350 micrograms of LSD along with, um, I think it was like five, four or five grams of uh, Ibogaine. Wow. Is that quite common to, to mix these two? I thought Not it's... that common, but no. the Ibogaine in plant form takes a while to take an effect. Right. And so he, he didn't want to just sit around and wait for all these hours, so he administered them both at the same time. And I could feel the LSD rise and peak, yeah. and then I could feel the Ibogaine like coming up from underneath it. Mm -hmm. And as the LSD was sort of declining, I felt this Ibogaine take over. Okay. So I could kind of distinguish between the two different feelings. So then what happened? Yeah. What happened? With well, the other what was, um, uh, you know, I, I sort of went through a lot of um, uh, surrendering, challenging things with the LSD. And it, but it was more or less opening and pleasant. Uh, but then, and it was kind of more centered in the head, kind of somehow or other more, um, I don't know, thoughtful, intellectual, kind of there were emotions too, but then the Ibogaine came, and the Ibogaine was like this very grounded experience anchored in my stomach. And it started because, I actually was thinking in some ways of Castaneda, also of um, this idea about death over your left shoulder, and that if you're aware of death, that that will help you appreciate life, and that you should try to be fully aware of death in all moments, not scared of it or paralyzed by it, but just aware that every moment is precious and it's limited. So I, I somehow was feeling this, and then I was feeling that I was um, holding myself back a bit, that I was scared to let go. And what then developed was this repeated cycle of um, this sense of the self-perfectionism, that I wanted to be more and more and more. And then was this understanding of the link between self-perfectionism, the self-critical nature, and self-hatred. Mm -hmm. And I started feeling how um, destructive this was, and then I would get nauseous and throw up. And then I would feel better for a little bit, and then it would come back. And I would have this sense, though, that when I was throwing up, and when I was vomiting, and when I was choking, kind of coughing, I was making it hard for me to breathe, and so I was kind of getting closer to the sense of death. Mm -hmm. um, and I felt that um, I just needed to let go, but I was the one preventing myself from doing it. That I knew the solution, and I was the problem. You were getting in your own way. I was way. getting in my own way, and yeah. I was hating myself for it. And then I was vomiting and throwing up again. Mm -hmm. And then, for a Jewish guy, I started having the images of Christ, and that I felt that I was being crucified on the cross of self-perfectionism. And that was just going over and over and over. And I, I couldn't undo it. I couldn't, this was this pattern that would just repeat itself and repeat itself and repeat itself. And it was like 10 hours then of just vomiting and of having very little rest time and just hating myself for it. And it was this horrible thing. And then somehow or other, it was like transcendence through exhaustion. Right. I didn't really resolve it. I just was so tired that I switched to this blissful mood of total acceptance. acceptance. And that lasted, uh, I was at a place, even though we were indoors, we were right on the beach. Um, I mean, the house was on the water. And there was these skylights, and so I could see the stars at night. And I kind of told myself that 
that since I hadn't earned this sort of blissful, peaceful acceptance, that somehow when the tide shifted and the sun came up, that I would be back into this nauseous space, but that I would have this night of peace. And this night of peace was just amazing, just watching the stars slowly go by and feeling the opposite of this self-hatred. And that I kind of learned this lesson, that I was learning this lesson, that, um, how totally necessary it is to have the self-critical part of your mind, because that's the drive to quality, but if it's linked to self-hatred, it's kind of paralyzing. And so I had this wonderful night, and then the, that the morning, the tide must have shifted, and the sun came up, and I was sort of back into this horrible state. But the Ibogaine had worn out a lot, and the LSD had worn off, and I was just, and I couldn't move. I was so dizzy or nauseous, and I couldn't sit up hardly, so I spent the whole next day in that same spot, just curled up like a dog. And, um, you know, every once in a while they'd bring some liquid for me to drink or some bananas or something to eat, but I could barely eat. Right. Um, and it was the third day, finally, that somebody came to get me, that I could kind of stand up enough without being dizzy. And, but what I noticed as I was leaving, uh, as this person was driving me back, and I'd never been to this house before, that I could predict what was around the corner, I knew. So somehow or other, I felt like I had burned up all this like self-chatter, not all of it, but a lot of this inner voice that's mm -hmm. constantly criticized, and that it was sort of um, burned up, and I could have more access to memory, and more access, and I kept sort of kind of thinking that I could tell, and I could tell, or remember what was coming around the next corner a lot of times. Um, but what has, um, and that was the fourth day before I could drive, mm -hmm. felt grounded enough. But what has stayed with me is this, um, why it, and why it's such an important experience, is that it's should have made my self-critical part of my mind into an ally instead of an enemy. Yeah. And so that I have this constant flow of what I should have done and what I, you know, and instead of being in an impunitive way, it's something I'm learning from. And I've also learned that there's a lot of opportunities for second chances or second tries. Mm -hmm. That, you know, you do something and it didn't work and you think the moment's gone and it'll never come again and it won't. But often in relationships or in what your work is, there's another opportunity to put it into practice, maybe not the exact same way. Mm -hmm. So I've kind of learned that I wouldn't have these critical ideas if I hadn't done the thing in the first place. And the, the doing the thing was the courageous move. Yeah. And so now I feel like a lot of the success of maps, to the extent that we're successful, is because of this constant fine tuning that is no longer so punitive. So I owe my Ibogaine mean, experience this, uh, and this crucified on the cross of self-perfectionism mm -hmm. to separate it out, the self-criticism from the self hatred me for this lawsuit against the DEA. We were suing the DEA to keep MDMA legal in the administrative law judge lawsuit. And what that means is that the administrative law judges make recommendations to the head of the agencies. And their recommendations can either be accepted or rejected by the head of the agency. So we won the lawsuit. The judge said MDMA should stay available as a medical uh, Schedule II drug but that its non-medical use should be criminalized, but that the medical use should be protected. And the head of the DEA yeah, at the time rejected the recommendation. But can I ask you why you feel MDMA is so important? I mean, maybe yeah, we'll get to yeah, that, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, okay, okay. okay. So the, um, okay, so the um, head of the DEA rejected the recommendation, criminalized MDMA. We sued an appeals court, won a couple times, then finally lost. Mm. And then it was clear to me that the only way to get MDMA back into being a legally available medicine was to work through the FDA and sort of form a psychedelic nonprofit pharmaceutical company. So in 1986, I started MAPS to be the vehicle to develop and make MDMA into a prescription medicine. And I wrote the charter of MAPS, the Articles of Incorporation, very broadly so that we work with all psychedelics, with marijuana, with non-drug techniques to alter consciousness. We have a, a wide range of things that we can do. And now it's 26 years later and we're doing a lot of uh, pretty important studies with MDMA for post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm -hmm. We're about to study, start another study with MDMA for people with Asperger's. And I think MDMA is so important because 
it's, it's a tool, it's gentler than the more traditional classic psychedelics like psilocybin or mm -hmm. LSD or ayahuasca or ibogaine that it's easier to integrate but that it's very subtle and profound and it helps work with fear it helps people to overcome challenging trauma from the past and so on an individual level we're working with Iraq and Afghanistan veterans even some Vietnam veterans with long-lasting post-traumatic stress disorder, with childhood sexual abuse, with women who've been raped, people who've been attacked. We're getting remarkable results in MDMA in the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. But I think MDMA is going to be the psychedelic that leads the way towards opening the door to other psychedelics because they're more challenging. And so just the way that MDMA can help an individual deal with a past trauma, MDMA can help a society deal with the trauma of the 60s and can help us in this movement forward to try to integrate psychedelics into our culture. But is there something unique, I mean you said it's lesser than something, but it seems like is there a unique quality to the yeah. MDMA? Yes. That I think, yeah, to yeah, that. yeah, that's a really good point. So the yeah. MDMA is not lesser, it's less visual. Uh, MD, what's unique about MDMA is that it's profoundly um, focusing on self-acceptance and opening the heart. And it does it in a way that um, you can integrate it afterwards. So unlike many psychedelics where it's difficult with 5-methoxy-DMT or DMT, the experiences in ketamine that can be so different, even in LSD or psilocybin, than your normal consciousness, that it's hard to bring back lessons and integrate into your, um, your personality and your psyche what you've learned. It can be done and it, it, these drugs are extremely valuable, but with MDMA, it's a very subtle shift from your normal approach, mm -hmm. that your stream of consciousness is not really impacted in the way in which even smoking marijuana sort of creates a non-logical flow, sort of a creative flow, uh, emotional logic, but sort of linear logic. MDMA doesn't really affect people's ability to, to think uh, clearly and cogently, but it profoundly opens um, the emotions and particularly helps people to look at difficult emotions in a more peaceful way. So it's really good for relationships where people have so much at stake. It's good for talking with someone and wanting to know what they really think of you. It's good for people who are scared of dying. We did a study at Harvard, uh, started a study with MDMA for cancer patients with anxiety. It was pretty helpful. Um, it's, it's got all sorts of uses and it's the kind of drug I think that will be the one that first opens the door into traditional psychiatry and psychology. Um, it's helpful if someone is going to be a psychedelic therapist that they've had their own experiences with whatever psychedelics they're giving you. So you wouldn't go to a meditation teacher who's never meditated or to a yoga teacher who doesn't do yoga. But in order to try to um, train therapists, it's important that they do these different psychedelic drugs. We have permission from the FDA to give MDMA to therapists as part of their training. But the traditional psychologists and particularly psychiatrists would be, most of them are terrified of taking LSD. Mm -hmm. It sort of exposes what they don't know about the psyche and their own psyche. And so again, as part of training therapists and training professionals to work with psychedelics, MDMA is a, uh, easier to make people um, be willing to try it. But I think that, um, for me, the key from MDMA is self-acceptance and this uh, courageous, uh, open-hearted feelings of love and empathy. It promotes uh, oxytocin and prolactin release that are the hormones of bonding. There's a paper by Dr. Torsten Passy who talks about MDMA as being like the post-orgasmic state. And I think that that's a really good way to understand that you're not striving. It's very peaceful, but it's very open and loving and, and deeply profound. Can I just ask you one question? Uh, why, what has LS or psychedelic research done to expand our ideas of the psyche and of spirituality? So the two, um, and then yeah. um, go yeah, back to you. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, that's a. Um, I mean, Stan Groff. Um, we're, we're having a big international conference on psychedelic research in uh, April in Oakland. Oh. We're bringing all the pretty much all the psychedelic researchers from around the world and it's going to be a big four-day conference. Stan Groff is going to be one of the lead speakers, and he's going to talk about what 
has been learned in 40 years of psychedelic research and how it challenges the paradigm of what we understand human beings to be and what we understand about consciousness. And so what he's going to, what I've learned as well too, is that there are um, a whole range of experiences that are um, different than how we normally process information. Mm -hmm. that, that, you, that the psyche goes deeper and broader than we previously understood and that this narrow sort of movement from birth to death and that your experiences are based on your biography and that those are what you're going to sort of explore, that there's ways in which under the influence of psychedelics or other techniques as well, that people can have sort of profound mystical experiences that our traditional psychiatry would call psychotic, that people can have uh, a sense of the sweep of time, the evolutionary development of life and you can sort of go back through these stages in your mind um, that seem authentic mm -hmm. rather than just imagination based on movies or books you read or something. That there are experiences of um, sort of emotional resonances with historical times. People sometimes call them past life experiences, but I think that you're into this web of life and that all life, everybody's life is our past life. It's not that I own this particular one. The I is gone, but you can kind of tune in to lives that had issues that are sort of similar in theme uh, to your own life issues. And at the end of it, it all collapses into that we're basically here and that this is what's most important and to use our time well while we have it and that life matters and uh, it doesn't really matter that much about what happens, you know, after we die. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think with psychedelics, it's taught us a lot about um, just the way in which um, memories are stored, the way in which um, people can go back to early childhood and have vivid, accurate recollections. People have talked about their birth experience and then they've had details and they check it out with their parents and it turns out that actually happened that they've never been told before. And I think the way in which you can, in a moment, reverse kind of lifelong patterns of either trauma or personality, that you can have these profound uh, transformative experiences. And then if you um, work to integrate them, then you can have personality change in a beneficial way. But the experiences themselves can, um, in a way, become a distraction. I think that's what happened to John Lilly in a way that others, that they get addicted to the unusual experience and they don't pay attention to what they're bringing back to it and how they integrate it into their life and then the psychedelic pursuits become destructive rather than healthy. So in a way, they're tools and they're kind of, how they're used makes more impact than what they are in mm -hmm. of themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.